Hello, and thank you for joining us. This is Imore, one of your hosts for today. I'm an academic, a business consultant, a best-selling author of multiple books on self-help, and also a MyPad honoree under the business and entrepreneurship space in the class of 2023. And this is your co-host, Jonathan, executive of MyPad, the most influential people of African descent. And you're listening to the Voices of Influential People podcast, or as we like to call it, the VIP. This is a show powered by MyPad, connecting to the most influential people of African descent. Today's episode is lit. It's titled, How to Unleash Your Potential. And we're excited to have as our special guest today, Robinson Lynn. Now, Robinson is an executive director of Momentum, Momentum Education, and that's a leadership training and development company that empowers educators on one side, but also students on the other side, emphasizing the profound belief that every individual matters. Robinson, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I'm uh, excited for the conversation, and I'm grateful to be a part of the MyPad community. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Great. So as you know, we're a global podcast, and right now I'm tuning in from the UK. Robinson, we know you're a globe trotter, so we'll be curious to know where you're joining us from. I appreciate that, right? I think it depends on the day, but this particular day I'm joining from the Washington, D.C. area in the United States. Awesome, awesome. And how's the weather, by the way? It is a raining day outside today. <laughs> okay, uh, same, as, well, quite similar as what we get here in the UK. Um, but great, so now we get on to kick off the show with some fun questions. So we'll start with this one. Can you tell us about your favorite film and why exactly? Yeah, I would say my favorite film, it's a film I didn't realize was my favorite until recently doing some reflection, is the movie Creed, uh, starring Michael B. Jordan. Um, kind of a sequel to the Rocky movies that I grew up with in my childhood. Um, and it was Ryan Coogler's second movie uh, directing and writing. He's also the director and writer of Black Panther. And uh, he wrote that movie, I think, uh, as a fan of Rocky, he had watched movies, the Rocky movies with his father when his father was undergoing chemo treatment. And they had used it as inspiration to kind of fight through that process. Um, and I had had a similar experience when my mother was going through chemo treatment of uh, finding ways to kind of treat it like a, a fight and, and kind of be inspired by. So whenever I'm on a plane or I happen to have an opportunity to watch it, it's flipping through channels. Creed always brings, puts me in the right mentality to kind of take on life um, and be inspired. Absolutely. I mean, just hearing you talk right now, uh, so much of inspiration just dropping on that. It's really, really about that momentum. Um, so let's get a lot into your journey right now. Let's get into that. You were recently recognized as one of the most influential people of African descent. Uh, can you tell us about your work in Momentum and how that has created an impact when, we, when you're looking at people of African descent globally in diaspora? Yes, um, I think... You know, I think about the work we do at Momentum, and it's really meant to give people the tools to get clarity on the life they dream about, and then the tools that they would need to actually accomplish those. And sometimes those can be interpersonal, sometimes those can be professional goals. I think a lot of it is in relationship to how we deal with community. Um, and so when I think about the work Momentum does and the work we've been able to support at MyPad, it's about bringing together people across the diaspora who may feel like they're in silos or feel like they are on solo missions and creating connections, uh, communities of support, opportunities to request and collaborate that creates win-wins really across the globe. Um, and so we do work that is reflective, but I would say we do work that is meant to be done in community as opposed to individual reflection. Awesome, awesome. Um, this is quite interesting. Now you talked about this and just made something else in my head. Um, you train both educators and students. I want to know how you're able to address these two interesting groups, um, how you're able to do that effectively and how you're able to build on, on or, or leverage, you know, on these two groups. Great. So I think about, I think that's a great question, right? How does momentum work with both students and teachers and leverage different tools for each community? Um, and my belief is that learning should be a lifelong process that we should probably never reach a stage where there's nothing left for us to learn. 
And so I think we have a diverse group of people, right? We have sometimes students who are, you know, entering university or just graduated. And sometimes we have people in our workshops who are counting down the days, not months, but the days until they retire. But I still think anywhere across that board, board, there are people who, if they take an opportunity to reflect, there's new lessons that they're looking to learn in life, new goals, new things they're looking to experience. And so I think the work of Momentum is heart-based work that is meant to get people, uh, regardless of their level of accomplishments, to still view themselves as a lifelong learner, but to really get clear what would they be excited to learn, what would be a new adventure that they are looking to accomplish, and what's on their heart now, separately from what they may have already previously accomplished. Hmm. You talk about lifelong learner. I think that's a big one, especially um, in today's today's world where we hear about um, learning and learning and relearning. I think these go together. And just look at that trajectory, because okay. you're literally creating that that corridor that connects. Um, especially you look at your offerings from teens. You look at the momentum workshop, all the way to post grads, and and then you look at the working class. And I think that's a very diverse set of um, different groups out there. Um, and I see you also have um, done lots of work for clients, your clients like George Washington. So that's education, NYE as well, education, Columbia education, but then going on to the MBA. It's quite interesting. And then on to Google and those kind of companies. So how are you able to tailor your products or your offerings to meet the unique uh, demands of this different teaming clients? That's a great question. I think, as you kind of shared, right, Momentum has a very diverse clientele. And because of that, how do we tailor our offerings across different sectors, right? We've worked with the private sector, the educational sector, small businesses, Fortune 100 companies. And I think my belief is that regardless of what you're doing, every business is a people business, right? Even if you're relying on computers, AI, manufacturing, it's still a people-driven business. And so the work we look to do um, is really to around interpersonal relationships, the ways in which people are interacting, the ways in which they are effective when we're working with each other, the ways in which we may be having an adverse impact that we're not aware of on someone else's impact. And so if we come from the mindset, I, I mean, I'm looking at that book behind you around mindset. If, uh, if we come from the mindset that every organization is driven by the people of that organization, first and foremost, with the product and the technology and even the finances being secondary, then we're able to look at, well, what are the ways in which the people of the organization are looking to grow together? So it's quite interesting, Robinson, that you talked about, because um, when you just talk now, I just kept hearing people, I heard impact. And I think these are very big things, um, especially with the fact that you're leading projects right now, providing meals to those in need. So question for you would be, how do you intend to operationalize that? How do you intend to institutionalize that, make it a thing that keeps going on such that you're able to consistently create that impact, um, you know, within Africa or across the globe, um, especially focusing on people of African descent? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think, um, what I'm hearing from your question around how does one operationalize their impact and have it be sustainable? Um, you know, I think about how it's great to have any type of impact, but I don't want to have the type of thing where it's like we did something once and then we never did it again, particularly if there's people across the globe of African descent who are, you know, would be a request for that kind of support on an ongoing basis. And so what we look to do is to build into our leadership programs as a structure for our program to have community uh, uh, as a consistent part that we are collaborating with others, whether it's from an organizational standpoint, from an individual standpoint, or even as a team, and then building on ongoing collaborations and relationships. I think I might have my strengths and skills, someone else might have their strengths and skills, but making sure that we're really consistently looking at what we all bring to the table and then leveraging it to what's going to have the larger scale impact um, is what I look to do and build into our programming so that every aspect has a what I'll call a win-win-win concept. If we're only producing two wins, whether it's us and the client or a particular individual and the organization, that's not enough wins to me. I want to make sure that there's something else that's being felt across the planet where we can measure and say, because we made this choice, look at all the people who are benefiting, whether we know, whether they know exactly our names or not, they're still being able to be the recipient of that support. 
Okay, so uh, one thing I love that you do, Robinson, is you also, within your training sessions, you love the use of storytelling. And you tell personal stories. And one person that you like to talk about is your mother. And I believe that that helps us to relate with you as not just a coach, but as a person. And so I know that your mother has had such an influence in your development. But looking back at your upbringing, what shaped you to be a young leader? Because you became the leader of Momentum Education at 25. What, what was a key moment or key things that shaped you in becoming a leader at such a young age? That's a great question. Um, when I think about what shaped me as a leader at a young age and my mother's influence, I think a few things jump out. Um, you know, I do share a lot about my mother. She was the founder of Momentum Education. I always proudly share that my name is uh, Robinson. My mother's name was Robin, so I'm literally named Robin's son. Um, and I think that shaped me, right? My mother was an extraordinary leader, and I feel like being named after her, which is pretty much unusual, uh, at least where I'm from, to be named after the the the, the your mother as opposed to maybe a father or something of that nature. I always felt as a point of pride and honor and a way of connecting with her. Um, and now that I'm a parent of a two-year-old, I think I've really seen that kids don't necessarily pick up what you tell them. They pick up what they see you doing. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to see my mom at picking up or choosing leadership roles consistently throughout her life, um, including one of the kind of fundamental moments of my life was growing up in New York City and directly after uh, the end of the apartheid in South Africa, my mother wanted to be a part of the healing of that country. And she moved my entire family to Cape Town um, at that point without knowing anyone in Cape Town, but wanting to be supportive. And she worked with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for uh, two years. And I was able to see her doing offering transformational workshops. Um, and I think the workshops were impactful, but for me, it was the choice she made that there was something on her heart that mattered to her and that she was willing to uh, go after it, to chase it, to not live with the regret. And so because I saw that modeled at a young age, I try to live my life in a way where I am going after the things that kind of my heart is speaking to, even if it gives me butterflies in my stomach, as opposed to finding reasons to, to stay safer at home. So I appreciate your journey. I, th I think one thing that speaks to me is the fact that your mother had integrity. You know, as you said, we don't always obey the things that we're told, but the things that we see. And so when you see your mom saying something and then doing the same thing, it, it's, it's a model of how to behave. And I know that you've evolved as a leader too over your, your life experience. And one story you do share is about your leadership journey, and, and which of course was marked by you becoming a leader at 25 years old. But what were key tips that you would take from that story and, and suggest the leaders that are still evolving in their journey now? Um, that's a great question. So I think about uh, the challenges that come with leadership and the challenges during my personal journey of leadership, and they don't feel super personal to me. And what I mean by that is I feel like when you choose to be a leader, you're choosing to live a life of challenge. Um, you may not know what those challenges are going to be, but you can pretty much uh, predict them to come the same way we would predict that there might be a rainy day sometime soon in the UK, right? And so when I think about the challenges I've uh, experience. One of it was becoming uh, a leader of an organization at a young age. Uh, my mother had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer at 23, or when I was 23, and I became the executive director of Momentum pretty much overnight. And I, uh, that was an organization that was already having an impact on thousands of people. And I was probably the youngest member of that organization at that time. But I think what prepared me was um, not looking to do a personation of what my mother would have done. And as much as I respected her as a leader, I don't know if I would always be able to predict what she would have done. And so rather than try to shape my leadership style to be someone else's, I wanted to be a lifelong learner, as we've talked about, and trying to learn what's my leadership style. What are the ways that feel authentic to me? What are the ways that I can find being effective? And what are the ways that based on what I'm bringing to the table, others feel inspired and motivated by my leadership as opposed to conflicted or defined or confined by my leadership. So I, as many of the challenges uh, that have occurred externally, I think most of them have been in relationship to internally learning myself. And you know, so much can be happening in the world. As a, I took over during a recession in the United States, uh, we offered in-person trainings up until 2020. And then all of a sudden in 2020 had to slip, go uh, pivot to being virtual. But I would say 
each of those external factors, I had to kind of do my own internal reflection to see what was the impact those external factors were going to have on the type of leader I wanted to show up as. And I like the fact that you guys switched, as you said, you pivoted during the, uh, the COVID period to doing virtual trainings. And I had the pleasure to be able to take part in, in a couple of those training sessions online. And I've noticed that there were a few tangible benefits that people experience from these trainings, such as financial growth, uh, rekindling of, or starting of relationships. And I, what, I wondered, what is it exactly about momentum trainings uh, approach that leads to such tangible benefits in people's lives? That's a great question. I think momentum's approach is meant to be experiential in nature. And I think that's what leads to tangible impact. And what I mean by that is sometimes we can know something theoretically, we can maybe know something that we're supposed to do, but all of Momentum's workshops are meant to be interactive in a way where you're coming to your own level of insight. You know, I can see someone else ride a bike, but it's very different to get on a bike myself and learn my balance. And we can talk about finances, we can talk about relationships, we can talk about the leadership role you'd like to take at work. But if we haven't designed areas where you're able to practice, receive feedback, and give yourself self-reflection, then it may be kind of a theoretical thing occurring in your mind, as opposed to something you can really map on and apply to your life. And so the intention we do is to create opportunities to pause, reflect, connect, and do interactive exercises that become a mirror to how we show up in other areas of our lives. Mm -hmm. And my belief is once we kind of are aware that there's a more efficient or a easier or a, a more effective way of doing something, we probably take that more effective way once we're aware of it. And so momentum workshops are meant to be a mirror to your life that looks to show you, you know, as a reflection, how you've been showing up in your relationships and in your roles. Whoa, 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 whoa. Interesting. Very interesting. Because when you look at the fact that you kept talking about feedback and, and obviously you need that feedback to be able to have um, the right kind of self-reflection to be able to improve. We've been talking about a life learning journey. And I know that even though momentum actually helps to orchestrate all of that, it's also learning, I guess. Uh, so the question now is, looking forward, under your visionary leadership, obviously, uh, Robinson, what do you, how, how do you see momentum in, in, in terms of how, how trainings will be, you know, um, going forward? What are those things you think um, are going to pop up? Now, I don't want you to spill the, spill the beans at, you know, you know, a hundred percent, but just give us some, give us a little peek into how the future of, of, um, of, of momentum will actually be. That's a great question, right? What does the future of momentum look like? And I would say it looks like something, even as myself as the director, I can have a uh, vision for it, but I think the planet and the people we're in community with also have a vision for what's next for momentum. Um, you know, five years ago, I wasn't thinking about how AI was affecting, in, you know, interpersonal relationships and professional roles. And now it's something I think about on a daily basis. So I think as the world continues to occur and new things form catalysts, I think my intention at Momentum is to make sure that we are responsive, we're, we're looking to grow, not just asking others to change, but we're open to change as well. Um, and I think something that is on my heart, though, is to look for as many win-win collaborations as possible. I think the vision I would like to have on the planet is too big for any one person to do by themselves. So it requires, similar to what MyPad does and putting the right people in the right rooms to have the right conversations, it requires being open to having those conversations and being clear about ways to collaborate. And so for me, the future of momentum looks like being responsive on the planet, but also looking to have an impact with other organizations, individuals, um, and great people like you both who are uh, already having a great impact on the planet. And I think by collaborating, we can you know team up and have a bigger influence. Wow, time does fly. We're fast approaching the end of the conversation, Robinson. And I just want to ask one quick audience question before you go. Is that all right? Sounds great. Uh, so if you could get everyone in the world to do one thing every day, what would it be? That's a great question. If I could get everyone in the world to do one thing every day, I think if everyone in the world could intentionally do one thing that they love um, every single day, I think it would create an experience of people being fulfilled in a way that I think would have a positive impact on others, right? I think when you're doing something that refills you, it's easier to find empathy, love, and uh, encouragement for others. 
And so sometimes I think it's starting your day with something that brings you joy and uh, rejuvenation in a way that then you'd be able to have the capacity to support others in the ways in which they may be requesting support. Robinson, we want to thank you for blessing us with your conversation. And we want to congratulate you once again, because you're now an official inductee into the MyPad VIP suite. And to our listeners, this has been Imo and Jonathan. Make sure you subscribe and follow us and tune into our next episode of the Voices of Influential People, because you never know who our next VIP will be.